So good afternoon here. Um, so who, good afternoon. Who are you and uh, what are you doing? My name is Timon Schep. I'm the creative director of the Setup Media Lab in Utrecht. And as well as uh, I'm an advisor on digital culture at the Kennisland organization, which is a, a think tank on innovation in, based in Amsterdam. Okay, and, and this laptop is, is running through the uh, platform economy in Netherlands, and you got it from, from Robert from, from the Internet of Coins. So what is your relation to platforms? Um, well, I think um, um, I'm more of like a researcher of platforms, so I, I explore the new uh, digital worlds that, that we inhabit now and, and the incredible amount of change that are happening and um, how we should look at those. And of course, platforms play an incredible uh, role in that. Um, and platforms perhaps as a metaphor for the internet, like the internet has connected us in so many new ways um, and is at the same time asking us so many new questions, you know, like it's, it's a lot of it's great that it's happening and a lot of things are kind of scary. So th the question that I'm always asking in my work is um, what's the balance that we're looking for between uh, the fun stuff of the internet and the scary stuff and w what do we think about it? Okay, and do you think people are uh, aware of, 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 of this balance? Um, to a certain degree, I think we all kind of understand that every t you know we always say that technology is neutral. So to a degree, we all understand that um, technology only gets its power when someone builds something with it, right? So with nuclear power, you can build an atom bomb or you can build a power power plant, and they have quite different uh, yeah, uh, implications. Um, so I think to a certain degree, we understand that technology can be evil and can be good, uh, but I don't think that um, a lot of people understand the really the nuances. And I think, like for instance, not enough people are nerds in the Netherlands. Like really, we need a lot more nerds. Uh, and nerds that understand policy and politics and that can think about all these issues and have a really uh, deep understanding and a, and a good opinion that really helps us to, to go for further than, than, than we do now. Okay, so we need more nerds and, and then uh, make the bridge to, uh, to, to, st uh, to set up? Yeah, <laughs> well not just more nerds, so but like nerds that also like talk another yeah. language, you know? Like we need to understand that technology is everywhere now, so we need to have more understanding everywhere of it. Yeah, so, th so, th so the combination of, of, of the technical understanding and the uh, understanding of the implications. Yeah, those people are very rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. too rare. Yeah. And, and, and with Setup, uh, uh, what are you doing with that company? Yeah, so S Setup is a group of, uh, well, makers and, and designers, but also uh, thinkers, like from the world of academics. Um, and we even have some artists in there. Um, and in Utrecht, we, we work together uh, doing very weird projects around technology. I shouldn't say weird, I should say fun projects that I've, I've learned to say, to say that. Um, but in these projects, we always try to reach a very wide audience uh, and to talk about these issues. So to basically to reach the crowd, you could say. Um, and a lot of these projects uh, also involve people, like to, to, make, uh, to make them join in and play a part in, in, in these adventures. So what you're doing, you're organizing uh, uh, weird or uh, fun uh, yeah. uh, uh, events. Uh, to let people think about the more fundamental questions. Exactly. I'll, I'll give you an example if you like. Um, like a year and a half ago, we did something called uh, the Digital Art Heist, the Digitale Kunsthof in Dutch. Um, and in it, we asked people to go to museums in the Netherlands and take their smartphones and install uh, the 1 2 3D Catch app. You might have heard of that. It's an app that uh, allows your phone to turn into a 3D scanner. You basically, take pictures around an object and it then uh, combines these pictures into a 3D model. And of course, once you have a 3D model of uh, an artwork or an art piece or like a sculpture, uh, you can then 3D print it using a color 3D printer. So what we were doing is we were copying the works from the museums and turning that into a new exhibit in the center of uh, Utrecht that basically was like a best of of the other museums. So it was kind of like a stab at them, you know, like, hey, what are you guys doing with this? What should we think of this? Because a lot of people are very happy with the 3D printer. And of course, it's an amazing device for a lot of new creativity. And that's fantastic. But that, that's a story that everyone's telling, right? But too few people were telling the story that um, there's a downside or a darker side that we, like the, the, there's a lot of uh, copyright issues that are coming up. Uh, you see that now there, that some of these, uh, these companies that sell these plastic toys, they're being copied by 3D printers. And so that's the first step sign that we see this, this, this issue uh, arising. So we thought, let's take this issue to the max and involve all these people in, in this art heist. Okay, and, and, and what were your main lessons learned from the project? Um, I think um, that a lot of people love 3D printing. I mean, that's, uh, to be honest, like so many people came to the exhibit just because they want to know more about 3D printing in the first place, right? So it's, it's still such a big draw. Um, we learned that it's really hard to piss people off, surprisingly. Like one of the things that we did together with a, a Dutch artist 
was uh, create some mashups of uh, Nantje and Mickey Mouse. So she created she created new works. They kind of looked like Mickey Mouse and Nantje at the same time. Uh, Nantje is Miffy for the English speakers. Um, so we were trying to piss off their lawyers, and but they didn't really reply. They didn't respond. So I think they, I don't know, maybe they understood that they were being pissed off or they didn't see the work. That's also quite possible. But I mean, it, p it points out to the fact that this is an interesting area for uh, for exploration. Yeah, but then also don't think that they doesn't that, that they just don't see the uh, the impact of it or the potential impact of it. I, I don't. Yeah, but I don't think even I understand the potential impact of it. You know, like like. Um, I see that this is happening, and I'm curious where it will go. Um, but I don't know how big this is going to get. I, th I think it's going to get, you know, pretty interesting. Um, especially as 3D printers get better, we'll get into more interesting situations where people are really copying expensive stuff. And on the other hand, that's great. You know, it's really disrupting a lot of businesses that sell cheap plastic stuff that you know might be um, that should be disrupted. Um, but it's something that we have to explore, I think. And yeah, and, and involving the crowd in this, involving the the public. Is, is, is you know, a lot of fun because I think a lot of people are now really starting to f understand this technology or seeing it. And that's, that's for us a big, uh, an important thing. When, when, when technology becomes mainstream, like when you can buy it at the, the blocker or the action or the local stores, then that's really interesting to us because that means that we're all going to have to form an opinion on it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I really agree with that. And I think that, uh, by this more playing st uh, uh, events, it's a really good way to, to really uh, attract with the, uh, uh, with the crowd and also, because uh, I think also with 3D printing, uh, our problem is always that this uh, regulation is always a couple of years behind the reality. And I think it's also uh, is with the 3D printing. So, so in what way do you think, because you also uh, work together with the old existing world for this project, in what way are they looking to these new developments? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, the fun thing was that we, we of course, positioned the project as uh, totally hacking the museums and uh, being very Robin Hood about it. Uh, but a lot of the museums actually did, did know we were doing it. We, we talked to them beforehand and we actually used uh, an open source 3D scanner called the Scanect to, to scan some of the works uh, even more precisely so we had good replicas. So the, the fun, a fun story I can tell you is that like, um, all the museums in Utrecht have a, a meeting once in a while, once in a couple of months. And uh, they got together and they said, one of them said, you know, we had this really interesting weird group of guys uh, and girls and, and they came up to us and they said, hey, we want to copy your art. But it was so weird and we're not going to do that. But then one of the other museums said, no, no, we've worked with these guys in the past and it was a really a lot of fun. Uh, so let's do this. And then, then it all happened. But uh, yeah, it kind of shows that, that um, yeah, you need to know the right people or you need to have some people in, in these organizations that, that understand the fun of it, that understand the joy of technology to really uh, get these projects started. Yeah, but then you're talking to the museum and, and not to the makers themselves. I, I can imagine the makers themselves will respond probably uh, different. Oh yeah, they love it. I mean, we, we talk to like 3D scanners and 3D printers and they're all like, you know, great, let's do this. So that's, yeah, the technology people already understand the fun of that. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and did you also did other projects that are really interesting for the digital world? Oh, uh, hell, so many, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've, we've slowly grown to do more of these um, these projects that involve a wider audience. So um, there was a really interesting project beginning this year. Like we are really exploring at the moment uh, because of Edward Snowden, these things like surveillance and privacy. So we decided to do a, a media campaign, like a public media campaign with posters in, in uh, bus stops and uh, urban screen videos uh, all over the Holland and, and another web-based campaign. And that one really went very viral. Um, and it's, it's called iedereenspion.nl. Everybody is a spy. And it explored this idea of, of, um, of covalence, which is basically like if you have surveillance, that's like you know the government watching you, that's top down. Then you have surveillance, that's when people themselves are looking back at the government. For instance, when you film a cop, you know you're you're controlling the controllers. But there's a third one in between the people. That's called covalence. That's when we look at each other and we're basically spying on each other. And that's one of those interesting new forms that's that's really. Uh, very problematic, you know, because it's something you can't really escape all that well. Like, um, like when, we, when we Google Glass is like the perfect covalence device, right? It means that there's a, a spying camera in places where it usually wasn't. At least that's my opinion. Like, you, you know, before in your private home, you were sure no camera was going to show up all of a sudden. But now your friends might bring one in and, you know, expect that it's okay to turn it on. So these are things that we have to work out as a society, society obviously. Um, Anyway, so to explore this, we uh, asked three uh, designers and, and, um, and three thinkers to work together in teams of two to come up with these things. 
One of them was a beautiful poster that uh, explored this idea that social media can be uh, like spy organizations, and you might be, might be able to show it. Another one was a gorgeous video by artist Jeffrey Lillemon, and he created a very scary, freaky um, a surveillance head that kind of looked around. And it was really, really great to see this in the center of all these towns in Holland. You know, like at night, you see this surveillance head going sideways and with like Facebook logos. And it's an art project, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but the third project, that was really the one that got all the attention, that got us onto CNN and um, things like that, and uh, international newspapers. And it was a project called Copy Copy. Uh, uh, and it's a project in which we sold uh, coffee mugs that had uh, pictures of young children on them. And we got these pictures from Flickr. Because a lot of people upload pictures of their children to Flickr, and they don't really pay attention to the license. So what they do is they give it a Creative Commons uh, a license that allows for commercial reuse. So we thought, let's do that. Let's, or they thought, let's do that. Dimitri uh, Tokmetsis and Yuri Fierman. They created these uh, mugs that, um, well, that they sold in an online shop, basically. Like, they made 100 mugs and they, they sold them uh, on demand. Um, and that thing went so viral because all the parents wanted to see if their kid was being sold on this, on this shop. You know, and together with media partners like the Correspondent, at which Dimitri works, that really kicked it off. Like it, it, there was a Twitter storm the first day that we did this. And it became, what, we, what I really like about it is that it became this touch point for a discussion. Like it became this thing that people could talk about. Like, hey, you know privacy? Yeah, well, sometimes you do have something to hide. You don't want your children's pictures to be everywhere. And we have to form an opinion on this. And that was the main goal of the project, to tell people that you know, sometimes it's okay to have something to hide, and we do have something to hide. Maybe not to the cops, and you want to help them, but uh, sure, but you know, in our personal lives, we always have something little to hide, and it's, it's too vague to say we have nothing to hide. That's too broad, like, we have to be precise. Yeah, yeah, a little bit too easy, I think. Yeah, I don't think it's, uh, I think, I think it's true. I think it's, as a people, we, we need privacy very much. Like, it's, it's the basis for our right to form our own ideas or, uh, or to form our own uh, identity. And, and, uh, that's something I really worry about. I worry about that we're becoming a, a nation of very uh, aardige people, very, very nice people, you know, like very uh, well behaved because we're all being watched or we think we might be watched. And um, I think partying is way too cool. Like there's a story about spring break, you know, this is this, this, this party in America uh, once every year where all the students, they go nuts, you know, like they, they, they flash their boobs and all this type of thing. But the, late, the last couple of years, this party's become way more tame. Way more tame. Like, the less people are flashing their boobs than ever before. And I think that's a problem. I never thought I would say that sentence, but... Um, it's really a problem because uh, I think as people, we need to release energy once in a while and to, to have parties. But if people feel they're being watched on social media, then they might behave, well, better, but, you know, less human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, and uh, what I like about your story, because you and also your colleagues, you really, uh, guys and girls uh, with a passion who want to tell a story. Uh, what you're doing, you're finding really nice uh, ways to share it uh, to a broad audience. So, so maybe some more heavy st stories, people always going to think about it because it's brought in a nice way in an event or in a campaign or in a video. Um, so. And wha uh, what I want to ask you, because I'm, I meet qu quite some people who are busy with, with following their ideals. I, I guess you're also doing it because you're really passionate about what you're doing. But <clears throat> they always have, or most of them, they have the problem, okay, I'm really passionate about what I do, but I have no idea how to make a living of it. Yeah, that's... Uh, so <laughs> so yeah. how do you make a living for yourself? How do you do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really also a very good question, because that's, that's difficult as hell. Um, of course, w w what we do with setup is, is extreme, right? Like we, we, um, well, yeah, we, we really don't make a big living, let's be honest. Um, so I make a living, but that's also because I also work as an advisor. So a lot of us, a lot of us, a lot of us at Setup work there two days a week, and three days a week we work somewhere else. That's what I do. So three days a week I'm advising governments and all kinds of organizations, libraries, um, on innovation, and then two days a week I'm doing crazy stuff with uh, this type of thing. Um, so it is difficult, yeah. But I think we all do have a, we can all find a middle ground. And I think we all should find a middle ground in that and, and see, I think even like designers have a, a big moral role to play in the coming world full of technology that, that designers will have to um, well, stand their ground and, and, and think of uh, how to protect human interests and human dignity uh, in their creations a bit more than they do now. Uh, I think, you know, that if I'm honest, I think the startup scene sometimes loses itself a little bit in Silicon Valley rhetoric, like, oh, we're going to fix every social problem there is with a technological solution. 
And I don't think that's really how it works. Or that's, I mean, it's part of the solution, obviously, but I, don't, I think too often it becomes the only part of the solution. And we'll have to look a bit like more holistically at, at these problems, a bit more at the, the humane part, parts of it. Um, and I think that's a challenge for the startup scene. I mean, I love the startup scene. I think it's so great. There's so many powerful people and, 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 and passionate people, but they do sometimes, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, lose sight of the, the human aspect a little bit. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree on that. And I think also the bigger problem is that they they don't take responsibility. Uh, like uh, the uh, uh, look at, gro at, at, uh, at global warming, at uh, being more people on Earth uh, as never before and growing. And they say, oh yeah, but we find some, some technology and, and it will fix it. So no worries about that. Uh, just it's, it's a matter of time and then technology will fix it. Uh, but okay, but what <laughs> if technology doesn't fix it? Then uh, yeah, th then they don't have an answer at yeah. all. Yeah, it's it's very human, you know. But it's also uh, again because the world is becoming so, so high te highly technological. This is something that we have to really think about more and, and talk about more. I mean, this is a horrible example, um, but uh, of the the 9/11 people who flew the airplanes into the buildings, a lot of them were engineers. And uh, I, that's that when I when I learned about that, I was kind of like I wondered. Well, you know, to engineers, the world is always there's a problem and there's a solution and you have to find it and build it. It's, it's very straightforward and, and, and simple. And um, that's powerful, but it's also kind of uh, dangerous. Um, so yeah, I think like we as nerds, and I'm a nerd, I'm a huge nerd. Uh, we as nerds have to become um, wider people, more holistic people. And, and uh, that's, I think, like the stereotype, of course, that's, that's, that's something that we're not very good at. Uh, but I think we, we have to try to be and strive to be. Yeah, yeah, cool. And 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 uh, I I also have asked ask a question for you about the the platform e economies like with crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and of course also the sharing economy, uh, because you was also talking about uh, uh, online uh, uh, re reputation, and I think reputation is one of the uh, most important discussions for the coming years because now we use Facebook as a passport. And I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, I also visited uh, two weeks ago uh, 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 Estonia, where I had an interview about the, the, the e-residents. I think they are doing some really cool stuff uh, around that. But uh, what do you see, or what do you think when you look at all these platforms like Airbnb, like Uber, like they're all collecting data for a, a, a personal uh, data profile, but they're also not sharing it. So, so how do you see the future of of uh, this reputation data? Oh, that's, that's oh, that's such an interesting question, and, and I. I, we're working on a project currently, and I can't really tell you all too much about it, um, but it's, it fits right in with this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a hint. Like, um, we're trying to form reputations on, on all Dutch people, um, and we're doing that in a way that I think um, is, again, a little bit more of the, the side you don't hear so much about in technology, which is that a lot of people are sharing their data and online and then forgetting about it. Like, do you, you might have your own the old Hives profile. Well, we have that. And um, um, you might be in the phone book back then. Well, we have that. And all kinds of data that we, l we leave behind and that you know, once in a while gets leaked, like the Ashley Madison hack. You know, oh my God, what's that going to do to a lot of people's reputation? Uh, if you combine all that data together, you get a very interesting picture. And I think more and more Russian hackers are combining it. And I think a lot of more of these data brokers, these companies, are looking for ways to, if I would be them, I would be looking for ways to integrate this data and create really intimate profiles of people. Um, and even if these companies like Airbnb don't share it, I think they, they will end up sharing it if they want to or not in, uh, once in a while. And there's another example of this that where I think that leads up to is that like in China, the, one of the, the, the stories in the news that I thought would get way more attention but it didn't uh, was that in China everyone's now going to get a, a profile, a government profile that gives you a score of how good of a citizen you are. And that's going to have effects on, on your, yeah, your standing in China and how the government treats you. Um, and to me, that's, that's really scary stuff, right? Like, um, I mean, we've always, uh, you know, rated each other in a certain way in a personal life, of course, but the government has always been kind of agnostic about that, right? They didn't really remember that stuff too much about you. I mean, if you were in prison, you got a record, but mostly uh, you were, uh, you know, other, all people were just the same, but now this, is, this stuff is happening. And for people who are interested in this, in this, there's an interesting book called Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom by Cory Doctorow. He uh, runs the Boing Boing blog, among any other things. And in his book, he wrote about a world where this is also, uh, where there's no money anymore, but there's a thing called Wifi. And Wifi is basically your reputation score, and that de decides everything of how, you, how your life uh, runs. And there's a, a great example that I, that I love, which is 
uh, there's a guy and he wants to take the elevator, but his reputation score is too low, so he has to take the stairs, right? The elevator doors won't open for him. Um, so yeah, we are, we, we are going to a world, or we could go to a world where this, this stuff happens, and we could build it, right? I, I could right now could build a, this. And in fact, I, I, in 2008, I, uh, with uh, another group, I built a system like that. We built this, this project called Gifted. Again, it was at a festival, and we gave everyone um, a little button with a number on it, a unique number, and then people could SMS uh, scores to each other. For instance, uh, one day we asked the question, how drug-free is this person? And if you thought they were very drug free, you gave them five stars. And if you thought they were very not drug free, you gave them one star. And then if you were at the festival and you went to the bar to get a cup of tea, the pe bar people would look up your number in the database and see what uh, you know, your reputation was or your perceived reputation. And then if you had a high, uh, high amount of stars, then you would get extra, extra cookies with your tea. But if you had a low reputation, you would not get any cookies with your tea at all. And we had this throughout the festival where there were chairs for people with five stars and, and really good chairs and really crappy chairs for people with, with low star, or low rating. So yeah, this, this is something that I've been exploring for a while and, and that fascinates me to no end. No end. And um, I think is, is yeah, something we really have to talk about together. And I think that's one of the things that Setup will be talking about uh, all year next year. Data discrimination is, is highly on our agenda. Okay, cool. And, and, and are you also looking about uh, at what way they are uh, doing the, uh, uh, the, the, the ratings? Uh, because I think the ratings on platforms, they are, they are quite poor. Because uh, you can only give a one to five star rating. I think the average rating is, 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 is 4.3. Is 4, 4. Uh, because nobody uh, will, will give a bad rating below three uh, unless it, it, it was a really crappy experience. Um, at the other side, I'm also thinking about, uh, like with Uber, uh, I'm, I'm using Uber a lot because I really want to talk to the drivers. And <clears throat> when I have a crappy driver, especially also in other countries where uh, there are quite some poor drivers, when I have a crappy pr driver, I think, okay, his source uh, was bad, but hey, I have nothing to do with Uber because I think Uber uh, uh, is a bad company, so I, I, I don't really want to help them because I'm paying them money, so uh, uh, they are already getting rewarded. And when I give this guy a one-star rating, he would lose his job and okay he's doing a bad job but i think he should uh, uh, get some money yeah uh, so how good do you think the passengers are now doing their rating systems um well i the honest answer is i don't know right that's the thing they are black boxes and i don't know how their rating system works or how their algorithm works um and that's a problem right and and these algorithms are having an insane amount of, of uh, of power over our lives. As you point out, you could lose your job if you have a poor rating, but you don't know exactly how this rating came about. And you have to trust that the system is fair in some way or that it, it, it you know, measures the right things. Or, um, but we don't know. And, and that's, I think, something that we have to talk about. So I, I don't know. I'd like to know. I think that, well, for one thing, I'm quite sure that a lot of organizations uh, keep a, a way higher score of you than just the, the one through five star system, right? Like, if I were Uber, I would know a lot more things about you and have a way more complex rating of you internally like with things like how nice you are, but also how, how, uh, how rich you are and all kinds of things that I would measure um, and uh, show a complex picture. And I'm quite sure that the NSA does that, right? Like all these spying organizations that are, they're all building databases of us and uh, they have a very precise uh, uh, suspect, precise, uh, yeah, um, profiles on us. So I'm, I'm quite, I don't know how Uber does it, but I'm quite sure they know more than we think they do. Uh, I think Uber is connecting everything they can get. And um, and I don't know, and I wish I did. Okay, so uh, let's find out. Uh, uh, thanks for the interview. Uh, I think we talked about nerds and, 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 and about boobs, so that was really good. But also really about the importance of, of being really aware of, of, of the more complex questions. And like what you're doing is set up your doing fun stuff to really let a broad audience experience uh, with the more tough subjects. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hear more from you. So uh, we need any help, especially also with the reputation the part. Just let me know. Yeah. And uh, have a good oh, day. Oh, one more thing. I mean, the, boob, the oh. boob joke, Like we do have to be also nicer to women on this and, and more equal. Anyway, enough for me. Yes, thanks. Good talking to you. You're right. Bye-bye.